Mickey Blanco, how can I begin to work as an independent artist? Mickey Blanco, I am a weirdo and I have artsy ideas and I don't know what to do with them. And I'm a musician, but like, I like don't know, I don't live in LA or I don't want to live in New York or I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so these are my little base opinions about how you logistically, in this day and age, through the use of your talent, and then social media, start your career. Like me. Um, okay, so first off, Mickey Blanco, how can I begin to work as an independent artist? Well, first I would ask you to ask yourself, what are you? Are you a band? Are you a solo musician? Are you a singer? Are you a spoken word performer? You know, it's in almost every religious book in the world. Know thyself. The first step I feel in building a career in entertainment on your own terms is to size yourself up and know exactly who you are as an artist at that time because it will change and grow as you change and grow. What are your talents? Are you a better singer than dancer? Are you a better recorded artist than a live artist? Are you a better live performer than a studio recording artist? Are you a dancer who would like to write or sing? Take a precise inventory at what you are impressive at first. Not good, but impressive. If you feel that you are not particularly impressive at any of your talents, then do not strive to become an entertainer. This life, in my opinion, is not an extended elementary school, and trying out for repeated talent shows when your talents indeed lie elsewhere will not improve your self-esteem. It will only feed blind ambition. You shouldn't want to be an entertainer just to be famous. Anyone can become famous. Make a sex tape. Go on reality TV. Take a shit in front of the White House. Boom, instant fame. But don't be delusional. It will only waste your time. And genuinely, the world needs more human rights activists and environmental lawyers anyway. But to stay on topic, take an inventory of what you are impressive at first, then what you were good at and what you were not so good at and work on all of them. If you are a wonderful singer, but not good at writing songs, take the time to try and write better songs. And also, maybe begin to work with a writer. You may indeed be a talent that people need to hear, but who needs to work with a songwriter to write your songs. And your focus is more on your voice, your message, and other aspects of the stage. If you are a spoken word artist or rapper, you most certainly are going to want to focus on your style your cadence, your skill. If you produce, you're going to want to work on your sound and make beats for yourself or other artists. But working with other people will help you create a, a creative think tank, and that is necessary. If you are more a fringe or performance artist, as I was, the first piece of advice I would give is to think about yourself outside of the art world context, because creating art is spiritual and insular, and it is for oneself. Entertainment is the opposite in some senses. It is for the people. The most important step I feel after really taking a creative inventory of your talents and working on your art would be like I said, working at perfecting your songs or your voice or your dance moves or your collective music as a band and to focus on your live stage presence. Watch people with whom you relate and try and learn from other artists but not copy them. I remember realizing at the very beginning that I would not be able to afford backup dancers. And since I began as a solo artist and not in a group, the idea of performing, the idea of splitting my performance fees with two other people when I was barely eating hand to mouth was out of the question. So I thought, I need to look at performers who are solo performers whose stage presence can't be ignored. So I used to watch live e pop YouTube videos. I'd watch Tina Turner live concert videos. I'd watch Beyonce concert videos and Karen O from the Yeah Yeah Yeahs. Why did I choose these people? Because I saw something in them that I related to in myself. And I knew that I was the kind of performer that once I got on stage, I would give all my energy. I would be wild, 
most of the time undirected, and I would exhaust myself easily. And sometimes I'd get so wrapped up in myself that I'd lose contact with the audience. But I learned from watching other people, especially these performers. I'd watch them, and I'd see what shared similar characteristics I had. And then it allowed me to brainstorm and try new things, and it gave me a model for my show to look towards. If you are going to be an entertainer, you must be good on stage. And that greatness may not necessarily be as a physical performer, but you have to be good in some respect. This is what's going to build your reputation in the real world. And this is what's most likely going to give you your big break in combination with your digital presence. But we'll get to that. So you're saying, but Mickey, what if I'm shy and talented? Say you're an electronic music maker who couldn't fathom singing or being a front person, but you make amazing, pe amazing music that the world deserves to hear and see live. I would say work and brainstorm to create a stage show that performs for you. Work with a videographer and create awesome videos to match your aesthetic for your music, to project behind yourself or in some other way. Work with a lighting person or set designer um, or hire or recruit dancers or other performers to be the performers for you, like the band The Prodigy did. Um, or say you are a singer with an amazing voice, but the idea of performing is just absolutely out of the question. Forget stage fright, you have greater than stage fright, you're just not gonna do it. But you feel as if your art needs to be heard. I would say, again, work with someone who perhaps, you know, you could create maybe an animated version of yourself, like that Hatsu Miku, or, you know, just in, in some respect, brainstorm and allow your originality to somehow funnel some way for you to get your expression out there if you yourself don't want to be the face of it. Um, so step one, pick your talents, work on your skills, figure out how these talents translate into a live performance practice and rehearse and perform as much as possible because it's the practice and the performing that are going to create your uniqueness. They're going to give you your ticks and your tricks and it will also teach you the most about how to communicate with your audience. The reputation you build with your music and performing through your stage act will genuinely, along with the internet, be how potential booking agents, managers, and larger record label a and people will hear about you, as well as music and culture writers, who will truly be the first, unless you strike out with a viral hit, to spread the word about you. Step two, your digital presence. Marketing yourself, publicity, and playing the game. The most important thing in your career will always be the music or art you make. I repeat, the most important thing in your career will always be the honest and earnest music and art that you craft. The second most important thing in your career will be your public image and the world that you create around yourself. The associations, the associations you have and how you'll be represented in the outside world. You have to decide on who you're going to be based on either who you are or who you want to be. As uncool as marketing is, the sooner you take off that pretentious veil that art school has given you and put on your business face, you will realize just how important marketing is. Record labels and publicity firms have entire teams of people for larger artists whose job it is to market and, pu and publicize them. And there is no reason you can't do your own research and begin to work for yourself. But you need to be smart. And you must first and foremost always, always, always be aware of what is currently happening in culture. Educate yourself with a little history of marketing strategies. And again, look to the careers of artists whom you respect and admire. Again, I reiterate, look to them, but do not copy them. Because your original voice is what is going to make you stand apart. So start with a few questions for yourself. Are you going for the pop megalomania like a Lady Gaga? Or do you prefer to build your profile as a faceless, anonymous musician, giving rare interviews and releasing music videos in which you never star in? Are you going to use sex to sell yourself? And if so, are you going to go the cliche route or try to be more original? Are you going to use your ideas to sell yourself? And what exactly are those ideas? And how are you going to articulate them in an original way. Will you create hand-drawn flyers that will suit the aesthetic of your music? Or will they be sleek and airbrushed club flyers? Or will it be an ironic mixture of both? What are the visual aspects of your music? 
What is the look? What will you wear? How will you wear your hair? Again, these things are not the most important aspect of your career, but the sooner, but I'm sorry, but they are important. And the sooner you stop being too cool for school and start thinking about this shit, the closer you come to creating your original image, which is what's going to have people associate you with your music and your talent. Step three, putting all your information in one place. The SoundCloud, the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook, they all need to be accessible from one site, your website. And each entity in itself needs to reference contact information on the other site, i.e. your Twitter should have a link to your SoundCloud. Your Facebook should have a link to your SoundCloud and your Twitter. Your Instagram should have your email, unless you're the performer who doesn't have any of that shit. <laughs> all in all, you begin to build your digital persona outside the music, but it all must come back to the music, and it all must reference the content you're creating. Okay. If the music you create is sad and mopey and emotional, it might be confusing to have a website that's a Technicolor acid trip with dancing unicorns. Consistency is important, but you must be original. If making, sad, tragic, if making sad, tragic music while adopting bright rainbow raver aesthetics is your thing, then make it work and let rainbow goth become your mark. But you yourself can never call your music rainbow goth. Never categorize your own music or talent. That is the job for writers and critics. You must create endlessly and without categorization. You must create endlessly and without categorization. My name is Michael David Qualabong Jr. This was sexual politics and logistical business strategies. Thank you. I can't wait to see the real full effect tomorrow night. Oh. <laughs> Um, it, I was really surprised that you said the first piece of advice you'd give was to decide what you are because it's clear that you've been so many different things. So, um, and you've managed to speak across a lot of different communities of practice as well, coming from visual art and evolving through all these different um, forms of practice. So I'm wondering, um, I guess, do you sort of decide what you are principally at any given moment and then that changes over time? or? How do, you know, why is it necessary, do you think, to decide I am a band or I am a whatever? Because I, I and I'm glad you asked me that, um, because you have to have, you must always, and, my, and, and I, I mean, I, I do this with myself, you must always have a focus. So like I said, like, you know, the first, the first image that I had of Nicky Blanco was as kind of this very, like, you know, fringe, you know, almost like, you know, like ghetto fabulous, like, you know, like, like teenage, you know, like everything was very bitchy and flirty and bossy. And then it became this very glamorous, you know, sophisticated, you know, uh, you know, uh, it girl. And then, you know, I realized that like that was like not a good direction to keep going in. So then everything became, the, uh, every, then I started the whole mutant angel thing. And then I was a mutant angel and everything was disgusting and sludgy and gross, you know. <coughs> And then, you know, and then I moved out of that and, you know, and then, it, you know, then it became this, you know, you know, uh, hip hop stoner raver, you know, thing. And so it's like, even though these are all just words I'm saying, they had been a focus and they've been a creative focus when it was the right time to be that. And, um, and I think that, I think that a lot of musicians and a lot of people go through this internal struggle about being misunderstood or having their art misunderstood, but I've always been something like, but it's always somebody like, like, like you said, um, who, who kind of switches it up a lot because I believe that your authenticity is not constant, that the only constant that we know in life is change. So if change is the only constant we know in life, how, how does my, and why does my creativity have to be just one thing? I have people who have, I, I have, I have people who have told me that, you know, if you probably had stuck with just one facet of your image, you might be more successful even right now. You know what I mean? Because people would have had one identifying thing to always go to you for. You know what I mean? But like I said, when I started doing this, it's like nobody wanted to, nobody in like a major label aspect, you know, wanted to like fuck with Mickey Blanco. And then, you know, I had like eight music videos later and this happened and that happened and I worked my ass off 
and they were like, oh, yeah, you know what I mean? So it's like, I had a, so it's like, I always had, so I always came from a mentality of fuck everyone and do what I want, you know? And so even, you know, I'm gonna be honest, even doing a lecture uh, is awkward for me, and I say it's awkward for me, and I mean it in this way. There's a part of me that has always grown up and aspired to be someone like Leonard Cohen, or aspired to be like Yoko Ono, or Allen Ginsberg, or Jack Kerouac. Then I have this other side of me that says, oh, you know, is, is doing a lecture, like, is that, is that really hip? Is that, you know, is that, is that really going to be, like, good for, like, you know, the 18-year-olds that I want to buy my album? You know, are, are they going to think, if I do too many lectures, are they going to think I'm too stuffy? Are they going to think I'm, like, you know, a nerd and, you know, not cool anymore? So it's like, I know that these are honestly things that inhabit my mind, but I've realized that your own journey is what's going to carve your niche in history. And so when the universe throws you certain things, and this is when I sound granola, but when the universe throws you, when the universe throws you certain things, I think it's your responsibility to use all of your talents. Because it would be idiotic of me, okay, and false of me. It would be base of me to to not appeal to a side of myself like a lecture that allows me to do something like this and communicate something like this, you know what I mean? And just, you know, make like club songs, you know, and act like I don't also have this side of myself. Hi, Michael. Thank you for coming. Um, th my question it goes a little more like in gossip realm, I think, or like background to discrimination a bit, but specifically to the art world. Hierarchically, you mentioned the experience being invited to perform with Sean at the MoMA as it, it, you kind of as a kind of liberating experience, an opportunity to have a conversation with your mother. Um, what about the MoMA itself? What about the MoMA's director? What about your recent, what about our Basel and oh. the kind of white privilege and the money aspect? Um, well, what's funny is that lately, you know, what's funny is that I don't know, I don't I was just kind of on a, Lately, like, I've just been in, like, the, like, art world gossip mill. And what's funny is that things that, like, what's funny is that things that have not actually been things have, like, people, like, written about. Um, and, and to really address that, it's like, that situation was really kind of, like, more of a bitchy exchange between two gay men that then got written about as kind of this, like, socio-political moment. <laughs> and... And, and, it, and it really wasn't, you know, I mean, you want to know the black or white, the, mean of the, black, the black or white of it is, I've performed at MoMA now, I think like two or three times, and I came up to Klaus, and I tapped him on his back, and I said, hi Klaus, and he didn't turn around. And, and I thought he didn't hear me, because it was loud in the room. And this is someone who like, I literally like, you know, I tour a lot, I tour a lot, so by the way, if you ever read anything about me behaving badly, Know that, know that, know that I tour a lot, so I don't really get a chance to know a lot of these people intimately. So therefore, it's like some of this shit is just like okay, it's just like what you know, what beef are you actually talking about? Because I'm actually not in the country enough to have beef. But anyway, um, so so I tap on the shoulder, he doesn't turn around. So then I'm like, okay, well he doesn't hear me. Meanwhile, this has nothing to do with me. He's handing out subway sandwiches to people at the party, and this really weird. Like, like he gave one of my like, you know, uh, one of my friends one, and like my friend like got really offended and was like, he just gave me a fucking subway sandwich. What the fuck is that about? So, <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, so anyway, uh, I tap him on the shoulder again and I say, hi, you know, hi, Klaus, how are you? And he turns around and he says to me, and I was not in drag. And this is another thing: people treat me differently when I'm out of drag, which is very telling. Um, but, you know, because I think when I'm drag, I'm like, I'm you know, some safe, some safe thing, or, you know, and I'm not in drag, again, I'm a black man. But so, <laughs> he, um, he turns around and he, and he goes, uh, please stop bothering me, I don't know who you are, and stop following me. Oh, well, why did he say that? Because then, you know, then I just like flipped out, you know, and, and what really had, had bothered me about that particular experience, just to address the gossip, is that earlier in the week, he had been posting all these selfies with all of these black artists, but here was, and whether he recognized me out of drag or not, he was just like a black person at a party, and he was extremely nasty, and you know what I mean, and to be honest, like I don't need to dedicate my lecture anymore to him, but <laughs> yeah. I think that like, 
you know what I mean? You know, anytime you're a curator of a, of a big institution and like you'd rather take selfies with like James Franco, like, you know what I mean? And not to discredit James Franco, but it's just kind of like, it's, it's stupid. <laughs> And I, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's how I really feel. <laughs> um, first of all, I really like the hoodie and the denim shirt combo. I need to do <laughs> that. <laughs> and I was wondering, <laughs> what is your next step? Uh, are you thinking more like a celebrity type career or more in the art world and trying to make statements? Well, um, it's interesting because for me, the whole entire thing has just been about like, you know, uh, basically after, let me, let me, I'll, just, I'll answer that question very easily. In 2013, after Cosmic Angel came out and all this stuff and all these music videos and all this stuff, I toured a lot because I got all these touring opportunities. And sometimes what can happen to musicians is that, especially in my case when you have no, you know, when you had no label support or anything, you can tour because you have to make money. And then when you're doing really well, as I was doing, you know what I mean, your booking fees increase. So I was able to make a lot of money, okay? But when you have to tour that much, you don't get to make new music. And so 2013, I toured a lot. And then I came out with an EP, okay? So I, had, I did have two releases. But then by the time 2014 had began, after, you know, I toured for nine months in 2013. So then 2014, I was like, okay, I need to take a break. So when I took that break, I didn't make any music. But we're talking about a break of like three months. So then in April, I was just like, you know, shit, I gotta make money again. So I went, so 2014, I toured for six months. And then I toured from April to September. Or is that six months? I don't know. So, so then, uh, and that was Asia, Australia, um, fucking South America, uh, Europe. So when I came out with Gay Dog Food, it was like, okay, like, I gotta come out with new music because, you know, you start to have people writing you, you know, like, what are you doing? Come out with music. But one of the things that I realized is that I need my next thing, like the quality of my next thing, has the bar has to be raised a lot, you know what I mean? That's why it's so funny to be like doing a lecture about myself because I have not come out of the album yet. Um, but, um, so, to answer your question pretty straightforwardly, I have just signed with a, a label service called K7, they've been around for like years actually, and uh, they, uh, you know, they like, they've been, they like, they've released some like crazy, like historic, like electronic records for people and some kind of big stuff in history. And like, I am, I, I believe, I believe like I'm like the first artist they've signed in a long time. And I think that like, I am their like little baby right now because they see the potential for where I could go. So the plan is to basically start to build my album campaign. And one of the things that I have always been really good at myself is marketing myself. But one of the things that has lacked in my career has been uh, my studio practice. Because I've always had to tour to keep surviving, I've not been able to musically develop as much as I would have liked to. So now, for the next probably six months, I am not touring, and I have gotten my first apartment in three years in Los Angeles and I am working on my album. And so what most likely will happen is that like this year probably I'll keep pretty low profile. Um, I don't know if this lecture is gonna be aired, so I'm gonna give away all my secrets. But one of the things that I hope to do is I hope to basically come out with like a little mini movie this year that uh, would be in two parts. And it's, to be honest, it's like, I've done a lot and you see my projector and all that shit, but it's like, I gotta, I mean, to be honest, I gotta start striving for like Bjork, like Michael Jackson levels, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, what am I doing? It's like, you know, as much as I love like the whole punk and thing and thing, it's like, those are parts of my personality that are the genuine parts of my personality. I don't have to prove to the world that I'm that anymore. So all that I have to do in myself, truthfully, is I just want to work, 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 work really hard, and I want to be in the studio every day or multiple times a week. I want, I want to be able to edit my writing. I've never ever once edited myself, which is 
a good thing because you can be like, oh yeah, like you know, you, you made those songs, some of them are really great. But it's just like not being able to edit yourself. How can you? How are you actually getting better if you're not editing yourself? You know what I mean? It's like it's like uh, there's certain aspects of creativity and songwriting that just go hand in hand. And then one thing that is true, and I would say this for any writer, is that you know that. When you get in the groove, like when you get in the groove after like two or three weeks, like the stuff that you start writing in the middle is like the best stuff. And then when you can continue to be in the studio, see, I haven't had that. So I'm just gonna work really hard, and then like you're gonna like see like what I'm gonna do. Because <laughs> it's like this is this is like it. This is like you know this is this is like this is this year and this year is a big. This year is building the whole campaign because. I'll just be honest about it. Um, I had no money behind me before, and now they are putting a lot of money behind me. And so um, I think that I've worked my ass off to be able to deserve what some people get off the bat. So uh, I think that it's going to be a good two years. 2016, you'll be able to. So 2015, there will be some things that I think are going to be some big, some big shits. But 2016 is going to be like the like, oh, I'm sick of hearing about Mickey Blanco. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I want you to be sick of hearing about me in 2016. OK, so I got a question about um, kind of the pink dollar and uh, how you see femininity in that. like. Uh, in kind of a counterculture perspective, I think it's not really um, accepted to be ultra feminine a, as a woman. Um, you know, it seems like it's very important for men and very praised for men to be feminine. Uh, but if a woman was to do an ultra sexual feminine video, it might not be well received. Um, so I guess I have a question on how you feel about ultra femme in kind of counterculture? Um, I will answer that question super directly. So I think, that in the, I think that in the past, we've had women performers who, has, who have successfully done that and you know, uh, been uh, hated for it and praised for it. You know, and you have like, you know, and we're not, I'm not talking about contemporary Madonna, but we have, you know, like, you know, like, Madonna, you know, of like, you know, when the Madonna was like, you know, Madonna, Madonna, Madonna was like really, when Madonna was really doing stuff that like no one was, when Madonna was really doing stuff that was like, oh my God, like, you know, sometimes when you think about the fact that Madonna came out with a sex book, it's just like, who was actually doing that, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, but it's really interesting because right now the artist uh, FKA Twigs is kind of being praised for how she's navigating her sexuality. Um, and I think it's really interesting when you kind of have uh, a female ingenue like herself who is being highly feminine but is finding these very original and unorthodox ways to, uh, you know, how can I say this, to en entice people into like that very primal, unglamorized, you know, female energy, which is like really the base, you know, of what will, you know, like, draw, I don't care what sexuality you are, you know, the power of woman is like a thing. So it's like to, you know, to really draw people into that primordial essence, it's like, and to be smart about it and, and to not just, you know, like, you know, take, an, you know, uh, take a, a photo that slightly shows your panties, you know what I mean? Um, I think, that, I think that, 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 that there are people right now who are, who, who are uh, articulating it in, in a really original way. But as far as the pink dollar, did you mean that question as far as like, ultra femme as in like lesbianism because I think that right now actually the music industry and culture in general is still having a really hard time with lesbianism. I think that gayness has become this like, you know, like everyone's okay, like we're all, we're all cool with gayness because everyone's gay, let's be gay, you know, like, and then you have like, you know, and then you have all these female pop stars who, you know, especially since 2012, I mean, I mean they've always done it. I mean, look at Madonna, look at Cher. But like, but, uh, but especially since since 2012, I would feel like you know you have pop female pop stars. You know Gaga. I mean, I actually I absolve Gaga because Gaga like just like is Gaga like is the new gay mother. So she's kind of different. But you know you have pop stars like Katy Perry and 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 you know just all of these. I, I don't even have to name names. Just you know all of them using gay slang. But it's funny because it's like you can champion the gayness as some kind of ornamental thing you can put on, 
But then none of these women are willing to uh, wear butchness. Where's that? You know what I mean? Like, where's, uh, and excuse my French, I don't want to sound vulgar, but where's, 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 where's being a dyke? You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, where's, where, where is, where's lesbianism beyond this uh, very fetishized and still kind of very uh, chauvinistic and very gross depiction of lesbianism and culture? It's like, people are, people are willing, and it's crazy, but people are willing right now to champion this kind of, like, gayness and even androgyny, but still uh, a lesbian's lesbianism, you're not seeing that played out in culture, you know what I mean? You're still seeing this lipstick motif, and I think that's lame, and I think that like, I think that that says still a lot about just how deeply rooted misogyny is in culture, because I, and I've said this in interviews, and I will say this here on this podium, Homophobia is a direct result of misogyny. Why? Because you're hating the feminine aspect of something. And when you hate the feminine aspect of something, you hate women. And if you hate women that like and love other women in a woman's woman's way, that says something about the wiring of our culture. You ended on such a good note there, so I want to see how much you want to unpack this, but I wanted so deeply to circle back around to gay militancy, because I know you toured a lot this last year, and you went to Russia, and that's a big topic, and I personally got to see your Facebook post and shared it um, about your experience in Russia, but I was just curious, since then, having been in Russia, but having gone back to the U.S. and being uh, interested in becoming more of a global presence, what is your interaction with those communities once you have gone, performed, and then left? They are like, and it's, it's getting, it's to be honest, it's, it's in some dark days. And they actually just passed another law that now I feel, you know, I used to justify going to Russia because of the gay people that would come to my shows. Because it's like, and I and I'd actually talked to, and Cody from Shun had told me this, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, because Cody's like kind of a mentor of mine, and it's like, when you go there, you are, you know, you are, you are, you are so much more than you think you are, because they don't have that. And even, it's, and even wanting or, or just any connection to that is just completely dead. And I'm going to be honest, when I go to Russia, or when I've been, when I went to St. Petersburg, and when I went to Vladivostok and, and Novizhny Novgorod, I felt free because you're, you're, you're free and you're with, I don't know, you're just, you're not under the watchful eye of the Kremlin. In Moscow, I do not feel safe. I do not like Moscow. and I do not like going to Moscow. And I feel bad for the people in Moscow because it's like that is the political center and, and, I, and people are angry there. When I had my show, I mean, what I didn't write online was just how obnoxious the bouncers were to us, just how obnoxious some of the wait stuff was. I mean, literally turning up their noses. I mean, like, thinking that they could, the promoters had to keep us away from them, because I was literally like, I, at one point, I was literally like, I don't give a damn, like, where we're at. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we, we're performing here tonight. Like, this is like our crowd. They didn't, they didn't like the audience. They didn't like the people that came. And Russia has actually recently just passed a law that has now, morally for me, uh, made it unfathomable for me to go back. And they passed a law about two and a half weeks ago where now transgender people and certain types of, I guess, really feminine gay people are not allowed to drive. Um, and you can read about it. It's like, it is a real thing. And so now it's like, I used to say, okay, I'll go and perform for Russia because I'll perform for my gay fans. They need an outlet. But now I feel like I cannot go and like, it's like I would want to go for the gay fans, but like I could not be in this country where like actual lunacy is taking place. You know what I mean? Because it's like that lunacy, it's like now, now you have shown, you, okay, it's like homophobia, I don't know. There's a, there's a certain kind, there's a, I mean, this just sounds crazy that I'm saying this, but there's a certain kind of phobia that's so age old and stupid, you're just like, okay, like you're homophobic, like we get it, you know what I mean? Like you suck. But, <laughs> Then there's a certain level of homophobia that actually becomes lunacy. And you're just like, oh, 
oh, not only do you, you just think I'm morally bad, but like you would be willing to commit genocide against me. You would be willing to actually kill off anything that has to do with me. You like actually want to exterminate me from the earth. And when certain things like that, like, okay, I get, wait, now, now gay people can't drive? Or certain gay people? Or a really thin person or a trans person cannot drive? Like, because your justification of that is that you don't want mentally disabled people traveling on the road. And now you're borderline, I mean, you already were doing things that were hinting at Nazism, but now you're just borderline making an actual Nazi move. And now, like, I can't, I, I can't, and I, I won't go. And it's like, um, and, and, and like certain places, you know, we go uh, and we tour and the gay culture, it's funny because when we're in France, every boy in France, like literally, I mean, not every boy, that's a big generalization, but a lot of boys in France, especially the younger ones, will be like really into saying they're bisexual, like, oh, I'm bisexual. But nobody wants to be. But nobody wants to be gay. Oh, no one's gay. No one's gay. Are you gay? No, I'm not gay. I'm bisexual. Um, and so, and so, it's like a thing where you realize. I mean, my me and DJ Larry, we were like, oh, wait a minute. Like, I mean, we were like, we were like, wait a minute. Being we're in southern France. We're like, wait a minute. Being gay is not cool here. We're like, oh, like, I'm like, have you talked? Like, have you noticed like everyone's bisexual? Like, being like, be, like, like being like being like being like gay like isn't like isn't like a cool thing. You know, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, is, it is interesting. It's just really interesting. It's really interesting because there are certain cultural attitudes where you're like, okay, you know, I get it. And then certain scary places like Poland, where it's like Poland's another place where like, I don't think I ever want to go again. Because like Poland has this really cool, Poland actually has this cool queer community, but it's just like everything in Poland is so serious and you go there and everyone's so serious and then it's just like, ah, uh, like, I guess I'll come back in 20 years. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs>